thank you very much. It was already pointed out that we'll talk about malaria today. Now, malaria is caused by a protozoan parasite. If you've never seen one of them, they look like that under a microscope. And it's transmitted by the Anopheles fly during its blood meal. And then this guy gets in her blood cells and it causes severe damage because it gives you inflammation, fevers, and anemia. Malaria, depending on what numbers you believe in, kills anywhere between 600,000 and 2.5 million people each year worldwide. Most of those are small children, between the age of two and five in Southeast Asia and in Africa. So it's a huge problem. But actually, malaria can be treated. There are drugs against malaria. There have always been drugs around. Think back in India, the English were aware they had gin and tonic because there's quinine in there. Quinine was a drug. Chloroquine. The problem is, these guys become resistant. And so, so we become resistant and those drugs don't work anymore. So we are constantly in search for new drugs. And in searching for those new drugs, people have tried different sort of sources. The problem, though, is that access to these drugs is a key issue. And that's why I talk to you about change today. We can afford the drugs, but the people in endemic areas cannot afford them. The new drugs that come out of this um, tree I'm going to show you in just a second, they cost 10 to 20 times as much as a person in Africa can afford. Just to put it in a framework, the average healthcare expenditure for a person in sub-Saharan Africa per year is 1.5 US dollars. So the drugs have to be very, very cheap. The challenge is that because the drugs are so expensive, there are many fakes. I just talked to somebody yesterday who works a lot in Africa, and he told me about 50% of the drugs that are sold in Africa against malaria are probably fakes. And then, of course, the results are very clear. The second problem is that the way that drugs are made today, they're typically made in the developed world, in a centralized fashion. And then they're distributed. That brings up one other challenge. They can be used as means of geopolitics, because I can give those drugs to countries that behave in a way in which I want those countries to behave, and those countries who don't agree with me or do things I don't like, I can punish by not giving them the drug. Because it's known that those countries in Africa that do not have proper malaria medication have a stunted growth of 8%. So it's 8% lower growth than it would be in countries without malaria. So it's a huge challenge. So what we have set out to do in my laboratory, we have set out we want to make sure that any person in the world that needs access to drugs against malaria should have access. They should, we should be able to produce enough of this drug so that anybody who needs it can have it. And this may be as much as 500 million treatments per year. And ideally, we'd like to do it in such a way that the drugs are produced not in developed countries, but that most or as much as possible of the value chain is actually being transferred into those countries that are endemic with malaria. So that's the goal. And I hope in the next remaining 12 minutes or so to convince you that we have now found the technology to do exactly that. The drug I've already sort of talked about that has to do with these trees is called artemisinin. Today, the most effective treatment against malaria is called ACT, artemisinin combination therapies. These are pills that contain three drugs. The most important one is artemisinin, and there are two more drugs. But they're so expensive that, as I said, they're oftentimes faked. So where does artemisinin come from? Artemisinin comes from this plant. This is Artemisia annua, in English, sweet wormwood, or in German, einjähriger Beifuß. This is mainly produced in China and Vietnam, about 70%. The other 30% is produced in Africa and South America. Now, it's been known for over 2,000 years that if you take a tea or other preparations of this plant, you can treat malaria. But it was only brought out in the 70s 
where people actually understood the molecular mechanism. And the reason was war. In the Vietnam War, the Americans had all these new malaria drugs, and the Chinese that supported the other side, they didn't have them. So Chairman Mao decided that over 500 scientists should be going out and they should be searching the old literature, old um, sort of traditional Chinese medicine recipes and look for medications that they could be using. And so a group of them looked at all these different things. They looked at sweet wormwood and they looked at molecular um, ingredients. And through that effort, they found a single molecule which they called artemisinin which they could purify out of a plant. And it's the most important drug today that's used. It's wonderful. But the problem is there's only 1% of a plant that's artemisinin. And 99% of a plant is waste. So today, approximately 150 tons are produced and almost 100 times more, 99 times more, are thrown away. So that's why it's so expensive, because it's difficult, it's hard, it's wasteful, and we cannot make enough so everybody can have the drug. So you might say, well, maybe chemists could make it. I'm a chemist, I should be able to make this. The problem is a molecule is really, really complex. It may not look like this to you, but it's actually a complex molecule, very dense. And what you see on here, you probably couldn't see it, but I tell you, these two are oxygen atoms. And there's no other drug that has two of these oxygen atoms in such a rigid ring. And for chemists, it's really, really hard to get these oxygens in the ring. And so they couldn't make it. But one thing people figured out is that there are ways to get oxygen into those rings. And that way involves photochemistry. And photochemistry basically means, very simply speaking, you take light, you take chemicals, and you transfer the energy from the light source onto your reaction. And that's how we got to the whole thing. I didn't set out to say, let's treat malaria. What we set out to do, we set out, we set, we want to create artemisinin starting from a simple precursor, namely artemisinic acid. Why? Because in the plant, there's this artemisinic acid or a close relative of it, and that's where in approximately eight to 10 times more amount. So instead of having just 1%, we have now eight to 10% of this molecule in there. So we can harvest much, much more of it, but somehow we have to use chemistry to transform it. And the chemistry involves a very, very simple trick. And the simple trick is that we take the oxygen that surrounds us in the air, and the electrons in oxygen around us, the electrons look like this. And what we gotta do is we gotta somehow turn one of those electrons around, and then we get what's called singlet oxygen. It's a very reactive species that can add to a molecule. And the way we turn this electron around is where we put a dye next to it. This dye absorbs the energy from the light, transfers it to oxygen, and the electron turns around. So that's known. Now there's one problem. I told you drugs are made by pharmaceutical companies that do that in very, very large centralized facilities. Oftentimes, these are reactors that are 3,000 liters big, because that's the economy of scale. Now think about a very simple experiment. So I want to do, this is a reactor. It has my starting material, artemisinic acid in it. It has a dye in it. And now I take a light. I shine it on here. That light will penetrate because it's colored approximately five millimeters into the glass. I'm stirring it, but still nothing gets to the middle of this glass. So in a small glass, it can still go. You stir a while. But think about a glass that's 3,000 liters in size. You cannot penetrate into it. <laughs> so, so that is a fundamental problem. So how are we going to solve this problem? And that is really what we, what we invented. We said, let's not use a bucket. Let's use a pipe. A pipe is thin. It's translucent. We can shine a light through that. And it's always going to be the same distance from a light source. So let's take pipes that, let's say, half a centimeter, where we can get all the light through this pipe, and then we can do our light reactions. And what you see here is exactly that setup. We can't see it, maybe I'll later if you want, but it's quite a simple setup. What we got here is we have a bottle in which we dissolve the artemisinic acid, the starting material, and the dye. We pump this together with oxygen coming from this tank, Little bubbles go in here. 
voice bubbles go in a translucent pipe into the in tubing into this reactor. It's basically a shoebox with silver foil. We have an LED lamp. We turn on the LED lamp. You shouldn't look at it because it's not healthy for your eyes. But basically what comes out at the end of the lamp gets a little bit of acid put in here and the people in the first row can see that you have now a change from red to green. There's a little more reaction in the end. We collect the green bucket and that is a solution containing artemisinin, the drug. And once we crystallize that out, it looks like this. So now, what we have figured out is a way to convert, starting from a waste product of a plant that's currently thrown away in about 10 times as much as what's collected, in 65% yield, into the drug. So 65% yield, the overall time from start to finish takes four and a half minutes. So you look at this reactor and I say, well, okay, <laughs> that's sort of a, a children's version. In this reactor, we can make 100 grams of drug per day or 35 kilos per year. So it would take 3,000 such reactors to make the entire world supply. So what we have now done, we have created a reactor that can make one ton of drug per year. And the LED for that is the size. And the whole thing costs less than 40,000 euros. And the whole thing is about the same size as what you see here. So 100 of those reactors are going to make the entire world supply of a most important malaria drug. So the technology is now under control. We feel very confident about that. But now the question comes, how can we make change happen? So we have a patent on this, which is important. We bring these patents into a social enterprise through equitable licensing meaning people should participate, create a social enterprise called Artemiflow. The social enterprise will build the reactors and then wants to produce a drug. But for that, we need a starting material. The starting materials can come from one of three sources. Either we take the stuff that's thrown away today in literally hundreds of tons per year. That means extractors have to give it to us, but maybe possible. Or we can begin to extract it directly out of the plants that's also possible, and I should say that's possible in endemic areas, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. Or you can even do it by biotechnology. People have created genetically engineered yeast to make the starting material, and you could then do that. The other thing that's important, even a one-ton reactor is cheap enough and small enough to be put in a place where people extract. So we can do it in a D centralized way. And I told you earlier on, right now everything is done centralized. We can do it decentralized and that means we can bring more of a value chain to the countries that I need of the drugs. So the goal is to enable people in those endemic areas to create as much as possible along the value chain of those drugs. For that purpose now, what we'll need is more development, some funding, and we are right now in a lot of interactions with the uh, um, Unit 8, which is a WHO, United Nations uh, collaboration. We have asked for money there. We are talking to um, some big donors and we are thinking about possible crowdfunding. With that, I was hopefully able to show you that a very small idea of doing a reaction, not in a pot, but in a pipe, can lead to a change how we can do chemistry and that finally helps us to fight malaria. With that, I'd like to thank you very much.